It's a series of questions called the Novice's Questions. And apparently there were meant to be a short list of basic teachings that young novices would, would study, get the basic ideas of the teaching down. And then they go on a list like this, what is one, what is two, what is three, what is four. All the way up to ten. And the most interesting question is, what is one? Because the answer is, all beings subsist on food. It's one in the sense that it's something we all have in common. Although food here doesn't necessarily mean just physical food. There's the food of sensory contact, the food of consciousness, and the food of intention. Our mind feeds on these things. And this is the way the Buddha introduces the topic of causality. And it's obvious that food is not a a positive image for causality. The Buddha is not the sort of person to celebrate interconnectedness, because inner being is inner eating. We feed on one another. And it's painful for both sides. Obviously for anybody who's being fed on, but even for the person who's feeding. Just the fact that you are dependent on taking these things in all the time. And the Buddha says to look at them, what are they like? When you're feeding on physical food, you're feeding on the suffering of others. Even if you're vegetarian, you're feeding off of the, the sweat of the brow of the people who have to work to get that food eventually to your plate. Sensory contact, he says, is like being a flayed cow, being subjected to insects. It's just this constant barrage of little tiny impulses here and there that have an impact on the mind. Sensory consciousness, he says, is like being stabbed with hundreds of spears in the course of a day. And the food of intention is like a fire, a pit of burning embers. Not pleasant images. All in line with the fact that the Buddha's main explanation of causality and interrelationship is that it causes suffering. And this is why the Buddha looked for a happiness that didn't have to feed. In other words, a happiness that didn't depend on causal factors, something that was totally independent. That was his goal. And then if you look at your own happiness seriously, you realize that this is the kind of happiness that you want for yourself as well. A happiness that doesn't cause any harm to anyone. That doesn't have the instability of constantly having to feed. Back prior to the Buddha's time, the sages of India were looking for infinite sources of food. It's interesting to reflect that the main image for their speculations was the image of feeding. In the West, our main image is the sense of sight. In other words, all the machinations the brain has to go through to make sense out of the fleeting images that we receive through the eyes. And the question of how do you check the world that you construct out of those images. Whereas over in India, they the basic image was the fact that just to stay alive, to be a being, you have to feed. The question is, how can you make sure that you feed well not only in this life but also into the next life? And how can you make sure that there's going to be an infinite source of food? That was the main theme of their speculations. But the Buddha said that that was futile. There's no such thing as infinite food. There's no guarantee for your food source. The only secure happiness would be a happiness that doesn't need to feed.
But as he realized in the course of his own quest, you can't say, well, I'm just not going to feed anymore and that'll be the end of it. He tried going without phys physical food. At first the Deva said, no, if you try that, then we'll infuse divine food into your pores. He felt that that would be dishonest. So he tried to subside in just a, the least amount of food, starved himself to the point where every time he went out to defecate or urinate, he would fall over in a faint. And he realized that didn't accomplish anything. So the practice does require food, and not just food for the body, food for the mind. And there are two kinds of food the Buddha talks about. One is the food of what he calls appropriate attention. You're trying to develop good qualities in the mind, mindfulness, the ability to analyze things, persistence, rapture, serenity concentration, equanimity, all the factors for awakening. These require the food of appropriate attention, looking at things in line with the question of what's skillful, what's unskillful. What when I do it will lead to long-term harm, what when I do it will lead to long-term happiness. You look at your actions, you look at your words, you look at your thoughts in this light. And anything that would come up to create a barrier for the mind, you learn to look at that with appropriate attention as well, so that you starve the barriers and you feed the good qualities of the mind. Once you've got those good qualities going and the mind is in a good state of concentration, that concentration becomes your food. The Buddha compares the different levels of jhana to different types of food, all the way to the fourth jhana, which he says is like honey, oil, ghee, sugar. These things nourish the mind. So in other words, even though we're trying to get beyond causality to a happiness that doesn't require conditions, we have to use conditions in our practice. We have to look at the practice as a type of feeding for the mind, type of food for the mind. So it's important that you look at how you feed your mind from day to day. When your attention slips, where does the mind go off to feed? Where it's typical feeding places. If you could take a picture of your mind, where would you find it sneaking off to feed? And ask yourself, are you getting good nourishment from that food? Because a lot of the food for the mind is like junk food. You eat and eat and eat, and it gives a little bit of nourishment and a little bit of pleasure, but it doesn't really satisfy. And so you eat and eat and eat some more. It's like those potato chips that they used to advertise, like, but you can't eat just one. And so you want to look at ways of feeding the mind to develop good qualities what they call the strengths. So the strength of conviction, strength of persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. These are the qualities that you want to strengthen the mind, and they provide strength. They both provide strength, and they are strengths in and of themselves. Conviction is conviction in the principle that the Buddha really was awakened. And one of the major things he awoke, and he awoke to was the principle of action, karma, that our lives are shaped by our actions, our happiness, our pleasure are shaped by our actions, the intentions that we act on. And having that conviction is a very strengthening thing because in, on the one hand it empowers you. You realize that you really can shape your life. There may be obstacles that you have to overcome, but if you stick with this path long enough, the path of skillful action, you will find good results coming. This is encouraging. It helps overcome apathy. It helps to overcome hopelessness, 
and it focuses on the right place, that regardless of the conditions of your life, if you act skillfully, things are going to improve. But there's also a danger there. I mean, you look at your intentions, your untrained mind, and you realize how precarious a thing it is, depending for your happiness on your own actions. This is why you really have to be persistent in sticking with this program of trying to abandon unskillful qualities and develop skillful ones, like we're doing right here. Your mind has a whole hour. It can sit here and fantasize about anything you like. You can dig up things from the past, plan for the future, and just entertain itself in various ways. But you're going to ask yourself, okay, is that the skillful use of your time? You've entertained yourself many times before. You've dug up the past many times before. You've planned for the future many times before. Does it strengthen the mind? How about being really persistent in developing mindfulness and alertness? In other words, keeping the breath in mind and then watching to make sure the mind stays with the breath. Watching the breath to see what kind of breath is easiest for the mind to stay with. Because after all, as the Buddha said, this path is something that leads us to something we've never before known, never before seen, never before realized. Which means you're going to have to do things you've never before done. So put some effort into sticking with the breath. And as soon as you realize you've slipped off, put some effort into coming right back. And this doesn't mean that you have to strain, but you have to be meticulous and strict with the mind. As soon as you sense that it's going to wander off, bring it right back. Wanders off again, bring it back again. Each time it comes back, try to reward it. What kind of breathing would feel really good this time now that you come back to the breath? And then with a second breath, what breath would feel better? Or is there some part of the body that's not being nourished by the breath? Could you breathe in that part of the body? Keep moving around, noticing the parts of the body that seem undernourished, that seem to lack energy, and give them a little dose of energy with the breath. And if they seem to want more, give them another dose. As you keep with this, the mindfulness turns into concentration. The Buddha never drew a sharp line between mindfulness meditation and concentration meditation. Mindfulness is the theme, the basic quality that helps you stay with something. And then as it becomes firm, it turns into concentration. Where the mind is centered but has a broad awareness that fills the whole body. And it's there in concentration that you can develop discernment and start seeing the way in which the mind feeds on unskillful things. And you learn to teach yourself the drawbacks of those things. The quality you're trying to develop, the Buddha calls nibbida. Sometimes it's translated as disenchantment, but it's basically the, the word that we use for when you've had enough of a certain kind of food, I mean really enough, not just a sense of being full, but you've gotten so that the whole idea of eating that particular kind of food just no longer appeals to you at all. And sometimes it's translated as disgust or revulsion, which may be a little bit too strong. But you had enough. And first you start with pleasures that you used to have. And you compare them to the pleasure that comes from concentration. You see that, that those old pleasures just don't measure up. And they lack what, for lack of a better word, is the nobility of the pleasure that comes from concentration, the dignity.
that comes is you're finding a pleasure that's totally harmless, that's based on restraint. As you get more and more accomplished at feeding the mind in this way, there will come a point when you have to have you've taken care of all the other old ways of feeding. You turn and look at this food you're getting from the concentration, and you realize the concentration is made up of aggregates. The word kanda can also mean masses, just masses of form, feeling, perception, fabrication, sensory consciousness. You've taken these aggregates and you've turned them into your path. Even so, there's still a little bit of clinging there. And we're for clinging, also relates to feeding. It's the act of taking sustenance on these things. And you've brought the mind to the most refined form of sustenance, the noblest form of sustenance you can take from the aggregates. And there will come a point when you realize there's still drawbacks here. Because again, you have to keep feeding. This is where the Buddha encourages you to develop all around disenchantment. Because once the mind is strong, it approaches the point where it doesn't need to feed anymore. You've got to learn how to overcome this last habitual remnant of that habit that you've been indulging in for who knows how long. So as the Buddha said, once you're accomplished at the concentration, you begin to view it as in, in, in constant, stressful, a disease, a cancer, something alien, something empty, not self. Whichever perception helps to develop that sense of disenchantment most strongly. And that's ultimately what will bring the mind to a point where it no longer needs to feed. It drops its old feeding habits, and it finds that happiness that doesn't need to depend on conditions and doesn't need to feed on anything at all. And for most of us, it sounds a little scary, because we're so used to feeding that it's hard to imagine what it would be like not to feed. One of the best analogies I can think of is say that you wanted to wander through the wilderness. But you're limited by the fact that you have to carry your food. The more food you carry, the heavier it is. The less food you carry, the less time you have to be in the wilderness. Suppose you didn't have to feed anything at all. You could wander to your heart's content. And Buddha has that image. He says that the range of those who have totally comprehended food, which means they've gotten to the point where they don't need it anymore for their happiness, food of any kind. So they leave no path. You can't trace their path. It's like he says, like the, the path of the feet of birds that fly through the sky. Their feet leave no path at all. It's total freedom. So this is where this practice lies. This is the direction it lies. It points to. Not to interconnectedness, because it sees that interconnectedness is unstable, and it's this constant process of inner feeding, but it leads to freedom. A freedom more radical than anything we can imagine, but it can be attained. This path we're following, we're sitting here meditating right now, this is a part of the strategy to get there. It employs feeding, forgetting you're ultimately a place where you're so strong you can put all your food aside. 